welcome everybody to Great Brown. Thank you so much for coming. She told us. We're going to introduce Dr. Alan Scarrow, who's the president of the Mercy Healthcare Quick System in Springfield. Uh, he's actually a, Midwest, a Midwesterner. He went to undergrad at University of Nebraska and then did his MDJD from, uh, from Case Western. You realize very few people do an MDJD. The only thing, he's actually married another MDJD, <laughs> his wife Mira, who's a wonderful physician as well. He trained at University of Pittsburgh, which arguably is one of the best training programs in the world. He trained on Steve Gennaro, Dave Lunsford, and then was very involved with policy, he did some internships in that, and has always been a real policy person. His legal background is something that all of his neurosurgical colleagues really value. Uh, he's given tireless amounts to organize neurosurgery. He's worked with the Congress, with the WNS. Uh, I know on the board we're trying to get him on because we really think he is a very keen and perceptive eye on these issues. Uh, but besides that, he runs a really large practice in Springfield, the eight man group. And one of our fellows who is with us, Chiazzo, is actually working with him. So it's a great source of uh, joy for us. He's published extensively, he's written stuff. And he's going to be president of the CNS, so I think he's really an example of what you can do for organized medicine. And one of the reasons I really wanted him to be here was I wanted him to talk to the residents and tell them how they could all be you know, involved in organized medicine, whether you're a chiropractor or an academic, and make a difference in the field. And he's really moved the needle forward on this. And so we're all very grateful that he's taking time out of his busy practice to be here. So without much further ado, Dr. Alan Scarra. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. It's, it's, it's really been a treat to, to hang out with you guys today and talk about things. So um, i got to tell you something up front. Uh, so this is not going to be a clinical talk if you want to hear about tumors and spines and aneurysms and so forth. I, I just, I'll, I'm sorry. I'm not going to talk about this. You're free to leave. Uh, no, don't be offended. Um, we're going to talk about some, some different things. And, and the reason that, that, that we're going to do that is that, um, full disclosure, the majority of my time um, that I, I spend in practice is uh, is trying to get the AV system to work. There we go. Uh, this is um, one of the hospitals um, that I lead. So I'm president of the Mercy Health System in Springfield, Missouri. Um, it's a seven hospital group, about 10,000 employees, about 560 physicians, about $1.6 billion in revenue. So while uh, four mornings a week I'm either in the neurosurgery clinic or in the operating room, the majority of my time is spent reading this, and thus the majority of my time um, that I spend thinking and reading is about what is happening and what is in the future uh, for healthcare. So that's kind of what we're going to talk about today. Let's see if I can make this work. There we go. So I wanted to start with, with this. So this is a guy named uh, Peter Drucker. Peter Drucker is probably the, the, the founding father of modern business management. He's a guy from Austria, spent most of his career at the University of Claremont McKenna. Um, and he has, I think, this sort of insightful thing that he noted about healthcare in the 1990s. He said, the hospital is altogether the most complex human organization ever devised. So when we talk about leading through disruption, when we talk about leading an organization, keep in mind that we are talking about one of the most complex organizations that mankind has ever known. I'm gonna read this next thing to you. This is a report from um, an accounting firm called Ernst & Young, Ernst & Young uh, Accounting and Consulting Firm. Accountants are not prone to hyperbole. They don't talk about grand things. They're very didactic folks. They talk in very plain language. So when I put this up here, uh, to me, this means something. The US healthcare industry is in the midst of the largest metamorphosis in its history. We are emerging from a time of, re of reform into an era of true transformation. Unlike reform, which suggests incremental progress, transformation signifies a fundamental change in form and function to create something entirely new. In healthcare, the entirely new is a highly collaborative, exceptionally efficient, technology-enabled system. In the collective quest, silos are dissolving and venues for delivery are shifting from acute care settings, like this, to community networks. Organizations are partnering, affiliating, consolidating at record rates. More payers are entering the provider marketplace. More providers, i.e. us, are becoming payers and taking on risk. 
Various industries from retail and food to consumer electronics continue to enter healthcare, weaving an ever more complex web of players and opportunities. So these are accounts that are saying this. And what they are noticing is, as they say, the greatest shift in healthcare that uh, anyone can remember. Okay, so this is the first thing I want to point out. So this is a slide uh, from Accenture, a consultant firm. What they're pointing out here is that it is likely for all of you in the room who are physicians or physicians in training, it is very likely that you are going to be in your career an employee. Two thirds of people in 2016 are employed by some kind of healthcare entity, a university, a health system, something like that. Only a third of people are in what we would traditionally think of and call private practice. So, I'm going to say that most of you in this room today either are employed or are going to be employed by some type of health system. What health systems need from professionals in 2016? I would say it's this. Clearly, it's to perform what you were trained to do to the best of your ability. I think that goes without saying. We all want to be the best that we can be from a technical perspective, from a clinical perspective, and then that's just incumbent. But what I'm going to make the argument for today is that that is necessary, but it's not sufficient. Here's what we're going to need from you. We're going to need your ability to lead others. That may be in change management, in conflict resolution, building culture, managing the unexpected, which always happens, motivating the teams that you work with, creating value, doing a market analysis. Those are the kinds of things that in addition to your clinical practice, we're going to need you to do, and I'm, I'm going to make the case for that here. There is a gap, I would argue, between yesterday and what we're going to need in the future from our physicians. In the past, if you think about the course of your training up to now, if you are a student or a resident, it has been about your individual achievement. It's been about your grade, your scores, the number of cases that you've done maybe. As you graduate and you get into a faculty or an attending position, it may be about the publications. You're going to keep track of your salary, your outcomes, your complications, your, your job title. But it's about you, you, you. But that's not where we're headed. Where we're at today and where we're accelerating towards is about team success. These are the metrics that our health system today and your health system gets measured on. It's population outcomes, the cost per patient, which includes all specialties, all physical therapy, all occupational therapy, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that's involved in the care of the patient. All cause readmission, healthcare acquired infections, which is not a neurosurgical problem exclusively, it's due to a host of things, including things like nutrition, which maybe you don't feel like you control directly. The case mix index, the net operating income, all of these are metrics that we are measured on, which are collective measures. They are not individual measures. Yes, individuals comprise the collective, but we're measured on the whole. Okay, so why this change? Okay, so here's here's my here's the beginning of my argument. In the beginning there were professions. Here's the definition of a profession. Professionals have a specific set of knowledge and a responsibility to generate new knowledge, typically that is turf to the academic institutions like this. Admission to that profession is dependent on credentials that are not given away readily or free. Activities are regulated by the group itself. This is so important. There is a trust factor with professions. You are going to act in the best interest of others as a profession and as a community, as a culture, we're going to trust that you're going to actually do that. We don't need a third party watchdog making sure that you're acting in the best interest of others and not yourself. And the group is bound by a common set of values and thus given some autonomy. You set the rules for what the entry criteria are into your profession and you abide by those rules and admit others accordingly. So, is this a professional? Yeah. How about that guy? Wow. 
would say no. I would say that that guy doesn't quite meet the definition of a professional based on the four criteria that I set before. How about that guy? Not everybody can be a barber. You can't set up shop. You gotta have a license, right? That guy's a professional, I would say. I put a barber and a surgeon next together because this was the beginning of professional societies. The Guild of Barber Surgeons started by Henry VII. According to Wikipedia, this is a picture of the first meeting of the Guild of Barber Surgeons. Interestingly enough, they came together because the Guild of Surgeons and the Guild of Barbers said, you know, we've really got more in common than we don't. Why don't we just throw in together and let's just be the Guild of Barber Surgeons. And there you go. That was the beginning of professional societies. Whether it's the Congress of Neurological Surgeons, the Association of, what's the neurology group? Association of Neurologists? What's it called? Yeah. Academy. Academy of Neurology. All of them started from these beginnings. But here's an interesting question, so why? Why did guilds and why did these professions and calling them professions, why did it start then? Anybody, why, this was around 1540 or so, why then? Okay. <laughs> was this? This is the Gutenberg printer. This, up until this time, you had monks basically that would copy transcript and send them out. It was very difficult to get information out to people. The Gutenberg printing press comes along and suddenly you can make mass uh, uh, duplicates of the same text. And if you're in a profession and you want to share the same body of knowledge, it's important to share the same information. They wanted to get together. They wanted to talk to one another because now they had this body of knowledge that they could share with one another. That was the beginning. But there have been changes over time. The Gutenberg printing press, it had its, remember Jeff Bezos said this about 10 years ago, he said the printing press has had its day. It's been great. It's over. <coughs> the dissemination of information now is almost instantaneous. 90% of the world's information is digitized. It is out there. Anybody can, 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 can access it. How about this? We no longer defer to authority. Would you agree with that? I suppose every generation looks at the generation behind it and says, well, I really don't respect it. <laughs> Skepticism is widespread. Why? It's easy to be a skeptic. If you and I are having a conversation and I say something you don't agree with, you're a Google away from confirming that I'm either full of it or I'm telling the truth. It's easy to be a skeptic. The cost of loyalty is rapidly increasing. Think McDonald's, they thought they had lock, stock, and barrel in the hamburger and fry industry. About a year ago, it all started to tank. All the loyalty, all the brand identity that they built up over 60 years, it didn't mean anything. People started to go away from it. From it, from it. Here's the other thing I would say. <clears throat> we are becoming digitally connected to one another in faster and more complex ways than we could ever be physically connected. And I said that fast. But let me tell you what I'm talking about. This is a look at the Silk Road. You're familiar with the Silk Roads historically? Kind of, kind of established, protected by Genghis Khan. This is a way to get silk from China, basically to Europe. It lasted almost uh, about 1,700 years. This was the main trade route. But not only that, it was the main way that information was passed from one side of the world to the other, to the known world. Anyone know what this is? These are under, there are 300 undersea internet cables laid around the world today. There is more information carried in those 300 cables in one hour than in the 1,700 years of Silk Road for existence. So this is Eric Schmidt, who is the chairman of Google. He said this, the internet is the first thing that humanity has built that humanity doesn't understand. It's the largest experiment in anarchy we have ever had. We are connected in ways now that we could never have anticipated. And it's happening at a very fast rate. So healthcare in particular is primed for disruption by that connectivity. We are comparatively slow at adopting new technology. It's usually about a generation. In some cases, remember Sunrise 
Semmelweis was the guy that, that who's the OBGYN. Austria said, hey, it'd be a really good idea. I think we'd wash our hands in this chlorine. Probably infections would go down from uh, from uh, from after uh, after birth. What happened? Infections went way down. It took oh, about another 75 years for people really to believe that. The cure for scurvy developed in the 1600s. You eat limes and lemons while you're on the sea, it tends to work. 200 years before that was about. Yes, things are adopted more rapidly today, but there's a reason we don't adopt technology real fast. Why? Because we're all about safety. We're not going to hurt patients. We're not going to experiment on people. We're careful about that. As an industry, as a profession, we are slow to adopt technology in general. R&D is focused on devices and pharmaceuticals, not connected technologies to improve outcomes. We are profit-driven in healthcare. We're not necessarily outcome. That's sort of the extent. I'm sure we can put the dense in it on the sides. But it's true. I will say, as, as the president of a healthcare system, I am constantly balancing this. If we were to do everything we possibly could do to make patients safe, we could not afford it. There's no way. I'll give you an example. Clostridium difficile infections. It's a big problem in the United States. It's a big problem in our hospital. You can wipe them out with xenon lights and with these little foggers they spread uh, hydrogen peroxide or something in the air. If we bought machines to clean every single room in our hospital, no doubt we would have a major impact on C. difficile infections. We can't afford it. We can't afford it. There's no way we could keep the hospital going if we were to buy all those machines and all the FTEs that it would take to run those machines. There is a tradition, and this is Aristotle, 2,300 years ago, that the physician is the center of care. This is part of my argument for <clears throat> disruption. You had a stroke, you had a trauma, tumor, the doctor in a place just like this, this is really your best hope. There's no doubt it is still true. But in a network world, second guessing is cheap and easy because information flows more freely. All that information that used to be housed in the minds of physicians that was promulgated by the Gutenberg printing press gets all out there digitally right now. Anybody can access You know, every month, 190 million unique people go to WebMD to get information about their health. It's more than all the physician visits in every clinic, in every hospital in the United States. One website. That's where people are getting their information. So today our ideas have competition with algorithms, which we're going to talk about more, linked databases, genome information, biological sensors, all that is key. The need for professional advice and information, still there, still present, I'm not arguing that at all. It's diminishing. Here's some more evidence for that. This is a look at the world, if the world was all at night at the same time. The lights will work. These connections are made. Today there are 4 billion phones, there are 2 billion computers, and 9 billion devices. That 9 billion in a few short years is going to be over 100 billion devices that are connected. We're going to talk about what some of those devices are here. There's an explosion in the amount of data that's being collected. Every second of every day, humans produce 6,000 square meters of IP storage that's promptly filled with data, stuff like this. Now here's an interesting little coincidence. 6,000 meters squared per second is the same rate which a shockwave from the atomic explosion expands. There is almost literally an explosion of data happening. It's because all of the devices to sense data are not being put in by your fingers on a keyboard. They're being picked up automatically, recorded, not analyzed necessarily by human beings, but by algorithms. Here's an example of that and how connectivity in neurosurgery is occurring. IBM, I'm sure all you know about IBM. IBM has a device called Watson. You ever heard of Watson? Watson is, these are my words, not IBM. It's a supercomputer. It's essentially 90 servers all connected together. It can process 10 million books per second. When I say process, it's not just input 10 million books per second. It can ask questions and understand at the rate of 10 million books, 
250 page books per second. It was originally designed to win Jeopardy. Remember Jeopardy? It was IBM Watson versus this guy, and they, Watson beat the guy. It's because what Watson is doing, as it looks as a, at a question, it's not just recording that and mimicking back a set of answers, but it's, that it's thinking. What's the context of that question? What are the possible answers? Which one is best in this set? Okay, so IBM bought a company called Merge. Have you heard of Merge? Merge is a big um, a pack system, imaging company. Billions of images in it. IBM bought Merge so it could access those billions of images loaded into Watson so it can read angiograms, MRIs, CTs, x-rays. It can build a model of what's normal and what's abnormal. Then they bought this company, Avicina. Avicina is a company whose product is a digital radiologist. It takes all those images and spits out an answer a reading of whatever image it's looking at. And it will say, the aorta is this wide at this level, there's an aneurysm that's at a four millimeter base and seven millimeters in diameter coming off the SCA, blah, 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 blah. Okay, cool stuff, probably not unexpected. But then they bought this company. This is a company called Explorers. They have 50 million electronic health record databases data uh, records. So what they're doing now is not just digitally reading all those images, but they're combining it with clinical data. If they're looking at, say, a CT scan of the chest, it would look at the clinical data that's relevant. Say this was a female. Say that female was on birth control pills. Say that female had a history of clots. It would read the CT scan in light of that clinical information and say, these over here probably, likely, are pulmonary emboli. It's more likely in this patient because of that history. All done with no human professional intervention. By the way, I didn't put it up here. They also bought a company called Truman. Truman is a company that essentially rates healthcare systems. It looks at publicly recorded data, how much you cost, what your outcomes were, what your complications were. So what do you think they're gonna do with that? What they're going to do is they're going to take this data, they're going to sell this to companies, they're going to say, how sick are your folks? We're going to make the diagnosis for you. We're going to run through this algorithm. And then, when inevitably your employee needs a healthcare provider, here are the best three in your area for doing this. And if you're wise, your insurance will pay these folks 100% of whatever they promised. The next three over here are not quite as good. We'll pay them 90% of whatever we promised. Here's the bottom 10. We'll pay them 70%. That's what they'll say. How about the worldwide impact of this? You guys have one of these? These can drop MRIs. Right. Um, cool technology. How many in the world do you think there are? Not many. How many think there are in uh, 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 Rwanda? Zero. It's, it's great for, for a small set of patients, but it's hard because it's expensive. It's expensive, and thus, uh, if, you're, if you're the Rwandan government, purchasing that doesn't make nearly as much sense as buying a million smallpox vaccines. Here's the thing. With the digital platforms, all these things are, these are all devices, scales, spirometers, uh, blood pressure monitors, glucose monitors, these things are cheap, a few dollars each. They're digitally connected, and with digital platforms, the marginal cost of producing each additional product, good, or service, it trends towards zero. It's cheap, it's easy to do, and it gathers information that's relevant. So in short, Due to the rapid rate of change in culture, technology, and connectivity, we are living at a moment where an individual alive today has more power than ever in the history of humankind. You have access to more knowledge, more information. You can use and are using more information than ever before. Now, what's the consequence of that? 
So here's the core issue, I would say. As I just mentioned before, professionals possess a specific knowledge to help their customers, clients, or patients cope with their challenges. That's what we do as professionals. But as knowledge is shared with little or no effort, professionals in medicine, law, consulting, architecture, et cetera, et cetera, are no longer the only ones that possess that information. This is a look at the law school applications over the last 10 years. Over the last 10 years, applications of law school have gone down, gone down by half. Why do you think that is? Why? Google. Yeah. Okay. Right. Why are there not enough jobs? You really need an attorney in 2016? Wow. LegalZoom, rocket lawyer, LegalZoom, 10 minute will .com. <laughs> <laughs> It's cheap. Some of them are free. <coughs> you want legal services? Yes, there are some. I mean, if you get sued today on all practices, don't go to rocket lawyer. <laughs> That's not going But for many of the things that we used to go to attorneys for, there's no need. That body of knowledge that used to be housed in the minds of attorneys <coughs> is out on the web. Anybody can access it. Here's an interesting. This, this, the, the United States Supreme Court last year made this decision. And I put this up here. Um, <coughs> if some of you are thinking like, well, that's the attorneys. And <laughs> they got what's coming to them. I'm glad there's fewer of them. I'm glad they're getting paid squat. That's, that's good. By the way, you know, we I just noticed it. Uh, in my, my, my organization, we hired a health care attorney, a good health care attorney, trained at a very good law school, starting salary. What do you think it was? $40,000. And we had a ton of applicants. $40,000. So, North Carolina State Board of Dental Examiners versus Federal Trade Commission. This is the U.S. Supreme Court, this is court decision from last year. Um, this is where there were some sort of, you know, strip mall, uh, 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 um, kind of a, a mom and pop shop. We're going to whiten your teeth. You know, it's going to be, you're going to look beautiful. They were not dentists that did this. Right? It was just a group of people. They bought some equipment. They went into practice. And the, and, and the, the North Carolina Dental Society did not like that one bit. So I said, there's a, so I said, medical society and specialty boards that are not actively supervised by the state, that's important, cannot keep non-professionals out of the practice of that specialty to do so is anti-competitive. Think about what I just was talking about. All this data is out there. You develop some software that's an algorithm on how to manage, I don't know, MS. You go into business. You say, I'm a manager of MS. You got MS, I'm going to pay Google to make sure my name comes up. You call me, I'm going to put it into this algorithm. I got great outcomes. And the Academy of Neurology, said, right? American Academy of Neurology said, this is crazy. You can't do that. That's, that's our territory. We manage MS. Supreme Court say, they can do it. That's never going to happen in neurosurgery. <laughs> Thank God they're not coming for us. You guys got these best ones, right? Da Vinci's, yeah. right? So these guys, so, so for, for those of you who haven't seen it, so this guy's got his hands in this device over here. The surgery is happening over there, it's across the room, connected by wires. And you can feel touch, you can get feedback, as well as you, know, you can you make motions. And very common. General surgery, GYN, ENT, CT surgery, use it. So today, he's about, what, 15 feet away from that patient. Think that's going to last? By the way, the US Army developed this. Why did they, they wanted their surgeons to not have to go into the combat zone, into the combat hospital, but to sit at wherever it was comfortable, somewhere in Florida, sit at that machine, and be doing surgery halfway around the world. That's what I said. And oh, there's no robots, right? I mean, you need our hands in the. Uh, today, ro 
robots play some pedal screws, they don't miss. They don't miss. How many times have you missed on a pedal screw? I've missed. I've missed. It's happened. Okay. <laughs> this is a picture of my cats. <laughs> Just a picture of the pause. Um, oh, oh, wow, are you serious? I'm learning these text acronyms from my daughter. She's 15, but. <laughs> oh, wow, are you serious? Okay. Um, you have Uber? No, we're not. Okay. not yet. Okay. Yeah. You know what Uber is. Right. Here's the analogy though. Um, Uber, pretty cool. Follow the same on your app, right? I want a car. Tells you where the car's at. Car comes and picks you up. They take you where you want. Um, why did that? Why is that possible? What what had to happen to make Uber? Smartphone, I agree. What about the smartphone? GPS. Yeah. GPS. Part of what you were doing before, when you had a cab, you would call a cab, part of what you were doing was paying for their knowledge of the local roads. Right? I want to go to the, the Chicken Little store. Right? I don't know where that's at. You know where it's at. Take me to GPS. I don't need a cab driver. Anybody. Anybody can. By the way, why would I want to own a car? What do I need a car for? My car sits in my garage probably 70% of the time, or it sits in the parking garage at the hospital probably another 20% of the time. I don't know, whatever. I what do I need a car for? The GPS enabled Uber to happen. Okay, now think about that for a minute. This is a care path. I got this off of the website from the Cleveland Clinic. This is a care path for back pain. My analogy is, is this essentially the GPS equivalent? Is this telling patients exactly where to go? And by the way, who controls that care path? So that care path is that it's data driven, it's based on outcomes at the Cleveland Clinic, which I assume they know what they're doing. Who controls that care path? Oh, who needs to control it? Does the Cleveland Clinic control it? It's out there, I mean, it just got off their website, anybody can get it. American Board of Neurological Surgeons, maybe they should control what's on that care path. Congress of Neurological Surgeons, maybe we should be. Um, how about individual providers? Maybe, maybe that's who should control. Uh, I would say all of that is the move. It doesn't matter. The patient control. What do I need to do? I have back pain. I follow this algorithm. Algorithm says, Six weeks of back pain and leg pain, conservative therapy. I go to the physical therapist. I'm not getting better. I need an MRI. Get an MRI read automatically by Watson. Seven millimeter disc herniation, compression of the fifth nerve root, concordant symptoms. Who's the top right surgeon in my area? I'm going to go here. Alan Scarrow, here's what's going on. Made the diagnosis. If you're top rated, you'll get full payment from my insurance company. I open a week from Tuesday, 738. <laughs> Uber's got GPS. Healthcare's got data. Algorithms. Care. <laughs> this is the four horsemen of the apocalypse, right? So all I'm talking about, this is, this is another acronym. Good news for people who love bad news. <laughs> oh my God, Scarab, you came down to Springfield, Missouri, and you're preaching this craziness, this apocalypse, right? You don't need us. We've dedicated our lives to this. People need us. Society needs us. Okay, let me go back to this analogy. Over the last 500 years, since Henry VII and the Guild of Barber Surgeons, what's been the difference between that guy 
and back down. Okay, here's what I was saying. Thankfully, um, we're different than we were in 1540. In 1540, we did things like lamps, oils, and things like that. Um, for a while, it was prohibited to even open the human body. We didn't do anatomic dissections. We didn't know that stuff it was against the law. But eventually, we got smart. And eventually, we embraced science. We embraced experimentation. And we learned. We got better. We accumulated that body of knowledge. We allowed our ideas and, and, and our success to be continuously challenged. Bloodletting turned out to be not such a great idea. We had to test it, but it turned out not to be a great idea. We got smart. We got better. How about barbers? Barbers followed changes in style and taste. That's what they did. I would argue that physicians over the last 500 years led change, barbers followed change. So put this all together. The difference between being a great neurosurgeon and a great neurosurgical leader is similar to the difference between individual achievement and team success. This is kind of going back to what I started out with. Yes, you need to apply your craft. It's necessary to the best of your ability. It's necessary. It's not sufficient. It's the difference between this and this. For many years, that was okay. To be individually great at what you did brought you accolades and titles and salary and it was great. Really. The golden era, some might say. It's not enough. It's not enough anymore because we've changed as a culture. Those things are important. They're not enough. So due to rapid changes in the culture, technology, and connectivity, complex health systems are actively being disrupted. To survive, they are relying on teams of physicians. That's what we, that's what I am doing today. I am relying on teams to drive all those metrics that I talked about in that gap slide. Teams of physicians, nurses, operators, managers, accountants, and technicians working together in ways they never have before. One way or the other, leaders will be found as uh, bound for those teams that deliver the success necessary for survival. Okay, I have a boss. I have a board that I answer. I've got to get results. To get the results that I need in my position, I've got to have good people. I've got to have leaders that are taking on specific tasks that are leading teams and getting results. I have to find them. Right? If I don't find them, I will be fired. And I should. There's a whole lot of people like that are looking for this. Here's the thing. It's not necessary that those leaders are neurosurgeons or neurologists or physical therapists. It's not necessary. It's not. They don't, they don't have to be. I have to find them. My charge is to find them no matter where they are or what their title is or what their position is. But here's the last slide. If you say, sterile, a fascinating talk, really. One of the best I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> you make a good argument. You know what? I love the opera. That's what I love to do. That's what I want to do my whole life. What I'm going to do. Thank you for that enlightening perspective, but I'm doing what I want to do. And I'm going to continue to do it, and that's the way it's going to be. I would say that's absolutely fine. You've got to accept the consequences. The consequences are the things that you're not a part of, somebody else is going to control. I like this quote. So if you don't design your own plan, chances are you fall to somebody else. And guess what they might have planned? Not much. Right? Here's kind of the, the maybe the 
thing that I'm starting to realize that makes me a little bit uncomfortable. It seems to me that medicine, particularly physicians, <coughs> are starting to fall into the mindset of employees. And employees are managed. Managers and employees often debate and fight about things. What I hope we can become, I'm not employees, but owners. Not in the literal sense, owning the hospital, but in owning our own results and being responsible for them. And realizing that those results encompass the behavior of many people that we don't directly control, but that we can influence, that we can bring onto the team and get the results that we need in our departments, hospitals, our communities. of medicine are driving things that there's an incentive to go to an economy of, of, of scale. So bigger is more resistant. Bigger is able to capitalize on the economies that we, we need to have in order to survive. But there's a difference between being an employee, accepting what happens to you, not being involved in the result just being a worker. That, I think, as, as faculty, you can't influence. Right? All those things that we used to think, you know, talk about 20 years ago, you're the captain of the ship, you're responsible. It had sort of an individual tone to it, right? I'm supposed to be the champion golfer. What we think, I think we, our, our, our language needs to shift to is that you do need to be great. But being the captain of the baseball team is going to get you a lot better results. You're going to have a lot more impact and influence than the other call. And that's the kind of message that you want to send. That's the kind of influence. Those are the kind of that's the kind of skills that we need physicians to have if we're going to get the results. by maybe five people and uh, so are you saying you know in order to manage this we need maybe five physicians who can devise a system that will take the, the benefit of the physicians into account yeah um, it's not five. <laughs> okay here's here's what I would 
Let me answer it this way. What I see happening in American medicine, today there are about 4,100 hospitals. There are not going to be 4,100 hospitals that survive. Right? What's, what's happening in medicine is the same thing that happened in manufacturing and retail and services. There used to be probably uh, 700 car manufacturers at the turn of last century. There are now three, four of you include Tesla, Americans. There were probably 10,000 grocery stores. Today there are about six chains that control 90% of all, all, all grocery stores. The same thing's happening in medicine. The smaller hospitals are getting picked off first because they can't reach that economy of scale. They're either going out of business or they're joining into larger health systems. I don't know if you saw about last, last month, Second largest healthcare hospital, hospital chain in the United States, community health partners, 130 some hospitals. They lost $2.4 billion. They're going to liquidate half their hospitals. The hospitals that they're going to liquidate are smaller players in the markets in which they're at. Okay. The consolidation is happening. It's not going to end up at three. But I think what's happening is that you're seeing regional players develop. So, Instead of a market like this having two hospital systems or three hospital systems, I think that's going to be a struggle long term. Now, within those health systems, you don't need every physician being the Winston Churchill or Genghis Khan of things, right? You don't need that. You need a few that I presume are, are leading for bigger efforts. But what you need is a lot of folks, a lot of physicians that are leading teams. That may be teams of physicians, it may be teams of a combination of physicians and, 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 and nurses and technicians and so forth. But it's going to be very hard for you as a physician to get the things done that you need to do on your own. And the reason is, it's just what I said before, it's this balance of, I'll call it the mission, which is to take care of people, and the margin which we have to have at the end of the day, uh, end of the day financially to keep the doors open. So if you came to me as Alan Scarrow, the hospital president guy, and you said, I don't know, I want to start a deep brain stimulation program. And it's going to be great. We're going to have all these people with Parkinson's and OCD and central tremor. It's going to be great. And I go, wonderful. How are we going to pay? <laughs> How are you going to all right, so here's how much money we get, and here's all the people that we need to hire. And by the way, there's an opportunity cost because you're, I presume you're doing something else now. Now you're going to be doing that, so we're going to give up that revenue. We're going to get this. Okay. That's what leadership A leader would put that together, figure it out, pull in the people that he needed to pull in or she needed to pull in to make the case and make it happen. But without that person, that stuff doesn't happen. Not everybody needs to be whatever. But we do need a bunch of people that are willing to raise their hands and say, I'll own that. I'll be responsible. Well, thank you so much. We have a little plaque. Let me see if you're coming down. Oh, uh, Thanks very much.